Hello, you're welcome to the Master Anatomy Platform, and you are with Dr. Akang. In today's lecture, you'll be learning about the breast, the mammary gland, its location, its structure, including the blood supply, innervation, venous drainage, the clinical correlates too. So the breast is a modified sweat gland that is rudimentary in males, but very, very functional in females. In fact, it is an accessory sex uh, gland, all right? So it's located, that's just in the anterior part of the chest wall, and uh, it extends from the lateral uh, sternal line to the mid-axillary line, all right? So lateral to the sternum, extends forward, extends um, down to the mid-axillary line, and in the axilla, it, it forms what they call a tail-like, a structure okay called the axillary tail of spin spence its boundaries um, superior inferiorly is from the r2 rib 2 to the rib 6 in normal cases of times it extends to rib 8 all right so those are the important things you need to know about the location of the breast okay now up until Puberty, the breast, the shape of the breast, the round shape of the breast is because of the fatty components. Okay, so adipose tissue is what makes up the substance of the breasts before puberty. Now, once a lady is at puberty, she begins to develop glandular lobules. Glandular lobules, all right? And these glandular lobules would um, uh, increase up until they become about 15 to 20 in number all right it's also important to note that in every breast you have what they call the suspensory ligaments of cooper that connect the dermis of the breast the dermis of the skin of the breast to the pectoral fascia pectoral fascia now what's the pectoral fascia it's just a fascia that lies above the above the pectoralis muscles, pectoralis major muscle, all right? But it doesn't lie directly, it doesn't adhere to the muscle. It, does, it has a space in between it. So it's a double folded layer, all right? And it has a space between that allows for freedom of movement of the breast, okay? It allows for freedom of movement of the breast on this uh, pectoralis major muscle, all right? So it's in between it, there's what they call the retro mammary space. That space allows the breast to be mobile around that chest wall. Okay, so that's it's important. So this this suspensory ligament of Cooper will divide. It's five. It's a fibrous septa that will divide these lobules into our 15 to 20. All right. Then so this each lobo has what they call alveoli. So alveoli would secrete the milk into the lobules and from there uh, it's going to go through the lactiferous ducts lactiferous ducts to the to the um through the nipple all right so the lactiferous would have lactiferous ducts will have these lactiferous sinuses around the areola this is a dilated part of the lactiferous duct okay a dilated part that helps you sometimes accumulate some um breast when 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 sucked the let down reflex takes the breast into the uh, the milk into into the la uh, lactiferous glands, also known as the glandular lobules. All right, then it it would drain into the into the lactiferous sinus and through that the fissures, you know, the lactiferous ducts will fissure through the nipple. All right, and the the produced milk could actually move into the nipple through that. All right, so that's that's that about the the structure of the breasts it's located yeah so we have the the breast located in the anterior chest wall all right has uh, fatty tissue and glandular tissue in adults all right but before puberty just fatty tissue all right and um it's suspended by the suspensory ligament of copper which helps to keep it up all right and um uh, pressure it's pressure actually that uh, pressure on this suspensory ligaments uh you know as the breast increases in size the pressure will help them make the breasts descend and 
So if the breast to remain pointed and rounded, it becomes pendul a pendula and, and it also reduces in the protrusion, but it descends uh, down and becomes pendulous. All right, so that's because of the suspensory ligaments, which is a bit weak. All right, so many times the brazier and some other things are used to hold the breast up and prevent the weight, especially in very big breasts. All right, that pressure would eventually make the breasts go down. So, anytime you're jogging, you're doing some marathons and all that, it's a support exercise that make the breast, uh, you know, go up and down and all that. It's important that the breast is held firm so that it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it reduces the amount of movement of the, even that it's going to weaken the suspensory ligaments and such that individual by and large have a, um, a somewhat flat breast. All right. So now the external features we've talked about them, but uh, let's just go through it again: the nipple, the areola, and the skin. These are three important structures on the breasts. Okay. It's been said that the nipple in nulliparous women is normally at the fourth intercostal space. Fourth intercostal space. All right. However, if this nulliparous woman has a very big breast, all right, the tendency is that the nipple, the breast would have, because it's big, it would have, instead of being pointed and protruded, it may have fallen. And because of that, uh, the nipple position is not going to be at the fourth intercostal space anymore. So it's not a very good um, landmark for the fourth intercostal space. All right. It's highly pigmented. It also has, it, uh, it's featured by lactiferous ducts. Okay. And we also have circular smooth muscles that make up that nipple and erectile tissues. It is devoid of fat, hair, and sweat glands. So that's the those are the things you need to know about the nipple. It has lactiferous ducts passing through it. It has circular smooth muscles that help you know help it and um, become erect during arousal or touch. Okay, so it becomes erect when when touched. It becomes um, uh, and the erectile tissue also help make it very very erect all right and then it's you you know that comes up especially during um uh, sexual arousal and all that okay now the areola also has uh sebaceous glands it's rich with sebaceous glands the montgomery chivaco this chivaco it looks like a bomb uh, so you see them as bombs around the areola the secrets they secret antibacterial oil that help prevent the breast milk from contamination. Apart from lubricating the nipple, they help prevent the breast milk from contamination. So oftentimes, ladies who are our mothers, lactating mothers, advise not to, you know, um, use soap to wash the nipple so that um, uh, they don't take off all this um, antibacterial oil because the oil serves a very good purpose there. It prevents that contamination of the breast milk and it it lacks hair follicles it lacks sweat glands those are important things to note about the areola and the skin of the breast has normal features just like on other skin normal features just like other skin um uh, but it has very very little hair follicles the blood supply of the breast is from two major sources all right we have blood supply from the axillary artery so we have the second part of the axillary artery the lateral thoracic artery and the thoracoacromial artery which uh, uh, supply the breast we also have from the internal thoracic internal thoracic so anterior intercostal branches of the internal thoracic artery then lastly we have from the posterior intercostal branches of the thoracic aorta all right so i said majorly from two sources but we have a third source to the thoracic aorta the axillary artery the internal thoracic artery and the thoracic aorta all right so the posterior intercostal branches second and fourth second to fourth intercostal branches of thoracic aorta
venous vein to actually accompany the arteries so there are two main arteries the veins there the axillary vein and the internal thoracic vein okay innervation is from the second from the fourth to sixth intercostal branches the anterior and lateral cutaneous branches of the fourth to sixth intercostal branches this innervation will convey both sensory innervation and sympathetics to the blood vessels and the smooth muscles of the nipple. Lymphatic drainage of the breasts has become a very important subject. You must understand about the breast because it's important, it's applicable in cases of cancer that has become very prominent now. So breast cancer has become very prominent and everybody just needs to understand how lymphat lymphatic drainage in the breast occurs. All right, you need it today, you need it tomorrow. Okay, so it's important to note that the nipple, the areola and the lactiferous ducts all drain into what they call the subareola plexus. Sub areola plexus of sapi all right now once they drain in there from there they can move to different lymphatic nodes we have basically about three important areas where lymph nodes align themselves so we have the parasternal group of lymph nodes we have the parasternal group of limb nodes, we have the axillary group of limb nodes in the axilla, and we have the sub-diaphragmatic group of limb nodes in just below, just close to the diaphragm, eh? close or, or and then around the diaphragm. So we have them called the sub-diaphragmatic group of limb nodes. So these are three important areas where limb where lymph drain into. And um the 20-25% of the lymph drain into the parasternal group of limb nodes, parasternal limb nodes, and they could move from there. To the opposite breast all right then from about 70 to 75 percent drain would drain into the axillary group of limb nodes uh, they are called group there because they have about five of them and they are arranged in five different locations all right then we have the sub group the sub diaphragmatic limb nodes that take about three percent of um, lymph, lymph from the breast so I'd earlier said that the axillary group of limb nodes are divided into five. That's why it's called a group. The rest, there is no group attached to them because they are all aligned in one location. But these ones are unique in the sense that they are divided into five different compartments. So we have the ones that are called um, the anterior group of limb nodes. Or some cases they call them pectoral limb nodes, the anterior limb nodes or pectoral limb nodes, all right, they are align themselves around the pectoralis minor, okay, so they will stay at the lower border of the pectoralis minor, and you'll find the limb nodes called the posterior group or the subscapular group, subscapular nodes, all right, they are align themselves around the subscapular vessels. Then we have the lateral nodes that align themselves around the axillary vein close to the you know humerus humeral head then you have the central group that are in the substance of the axilla the fatty substance of the axilla all right so again the final group called the epical group one thing is unique about this epical group of lymph nodes you find them that um, they uh, will receive all the lymph from the from the lateral, the anterior, the posterior, the central group, they all drain into the apical group. And from the apical group, where are they going to? So from the apical group, they will go to the subclavian lymphatic trunk. From the apical group, the subclavian lymphatic trunk, and from that subclavian lymphatic trunk, it would go into the subclavian vein or the right jugular vein if it's on the right side if it's on the left side it will drain into the thoracic duct okay so we drain the thoracic duct if it's on the left side 
Now, there are some other kinds of division of this Aguilar group of limbs. Some people, some clinicians divide it into three. So we have the nodes inferior to the pectoralis minor. So they divide it into three with the pectoralis minor as the axis. So the group inferior, and you have the nodes behind the um, pectoralis minor, and you have the nodes just above the pectoralis minor. Okay. Having said that, um, let's look at the clinical correlates now of the breasts. Now, it's in, because of the lactiferous ducts, the several lactiferous ducts that run from the nipple of the breast downwards, okay? So it's important that sec, um, incisions on the breast should be radial incisions to avoid cutting too many of these ducts, all right? Then if there is an abscess on the breast, it's important to break this those um, uh, loculi such that it doesn't drain, so that it doesn't drain into another breast, okay? They drain, they break them properly, let them drain properly, and um, prevents the abscess from, you know, spreading into the other breast, the adjacent breast. There could also be lymphedema if there is obstruction to the lymphatic drainage of the breast. So I told you earlier on that, you know, the breast on the, uh, it, now, okay, there's something we didn't talk about. If we have this breast divided into, into four, into four quadrants, where you have the supramedial, superlateral side, inferomedial, inferolateral side, okay? Now, you know that most of the lymph on the superlateral side and even the inf uh, inferior lateral side will drain into the axillary group of limb nodes. But the tendency of those on the um, uh, those on the supramedial and su inferior medial to drain into the parasinal side is high too. And um, some of the those ones located inferiorly may drain into the subdiaphragmatic group of limb nodes. All right. So now, if we have obstruction in the pathway of this drainage lymph will gather within the breast and the subcutaneous layer of the breast causing an edema in the breast so the breast is going to look uh, floppy it's going to look swollen and all that and so if it does that um that you know that there's a problem blockage and we call that lymphedema all right again when there is cancer and um you could you have a situation where the the uh, the lactiferous sorry the suspensory ligaments are being shortened uh, because of cancer. So it's if, if you have that traction on the on the fi that's fibro that fibrous septum, it would cause shrinking in the skin of the breast. When you have shrinkage in the skin of the breast, it begins to have it develop things like what they call um the um, orange peel shape on the breast, and this is what this so it looks like this rough a bit. And the skin begins to become rough and all that because of the fibrous septa that's been affected. And once that happens, we call that pudorange. Pudorange, orange peel shape. All right. All right. Remember, I also said that the fibrous septa suspends the dermis of the skin, uh, um, connects the dermis of the skin to the pectoral fascia. All right. So if you look closely you realize you see a dimple here a dimple on the skin of this breast now this is caused um due to the fact that the fibrous septum that connects that fibrous septum the uh, ligaments suspension ligaments of cooper has been shortened by cancer all right so that pool on the skin has caused this dimple so this is the shortening is very conspicuous that it has led to a dimple on the skin so we call this skin dimpling and that's um that's another sign of um late late metastasis so the nipple could also get retracted you can see that there's no nipple here showing now this is because 
you, you know that the, the lactiferous duct, we had talked about it before, that the, the permeates the nipple, all right? And it doesn't just permeate, but you know, it's, it's it, because of the circular, smooth circular muscles, it's just stuck there. So now that there's a retraction, due to cancer on the lactiferous duct, so that it shortens, it drags the whole nipple in, inside, all right? So it may not be full, 100% like this is, it may, you may just realize that there is a retraction of the nipple, 50% retraction or whatever, but there is that retraction, and that shows that there is also cancer re causing um, traction of the lactiferous ducts there. And this is also known as serous tumor. So metastasis could spread to the abdomen through the subdiaphragmatic lymph nodes. It could um, uh, cancer could metastasize to the axilla through the axilla group of lymph nodes. We could have metastasis to the opposite breast through the uh, parasternal lymph nodes. Okay, so communication between the parasternal lymph nodes. So how does breast cancer metastasize to the entire body? Now, we've talked about the axillary group of lymph nodes before and how they all drain into the apical lymph nodes. From there, they will drain into the subclavian lymphatic trunk. And from there, this lymph would drain to the subclavian vein if it's on the right side. And from the subclavian vein, it will go into the right brachiocephalic and then the superior vena cava and then the right atrium. But if it's on the left side, this um, axillary group of lymph nodes will drain into the subclavian lymphatic trunk and then it will move and drain finally into the thoracic trunk, thoracic ducts, sorry. Then from that thoracic duct, it will drain into the into the left brachiocephalic vein however that's at the junction venous junction venous angle of pig off venous angle of pig off between the junction of, of the left subclavian vein and the left internal jugular vein all right then from there, it will go to the left brachiocephalic, then superior vena cava, and the right atrium. Having said that, how does it get to the brain? How does metastasis get to the brain? It moves via the posterior intercostal veins. Now, remember we had said earlier on that the veins, the venous drainage of the breast accompanies that of the arteries. All right? And we had said that there are two major veins, the axillary vein and the internal, internal, internal thoracic vein. All right. So the posterior intercostal vein is the vein we didn't talk about. Right. Now, this posterior intercostal veins will drain into the azygos and the hemiazygos veins, which communicates with the internal vertebral veins. And this internal vertebral vein is the internal vertebral venous plexus surround the spinal cord. Once it gets to the spinal cord, it surely gets to the senior body, which is the brain. Uh, and that's how this met metastasis could occur in different parts. Now, extreme cases of metastasis, like late cases of metastasis, would eventually affect the retro mammary space, causing the pectoral fissure to stick to the pectoralis major muscle. So in cases like this, when the pectoralis major muscle contracts, you find that the, in the breast will be elevated. Once the breast is elevated, you know that, okay, there is a situation here, and that is breast cancer at its late stage. All right, so you've come to the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening i would advise that you attempt the quiz on the master anatomy platform all right test what you've learned today and if you have any problem if you have questions you could 
email us you could contact us on the master anatomy platform all right uh, i hope you did enjoy the lecture and uh, i would like you to subscribe to our channel on youtube the master anatomy platform on youtube and uh, to get more updates on what's happening lectures that come up and all that thank you have a nice time see you again